Okay, we are now recording. Great, uh, thank you everybody. And um, thanks, Stephanie. Um, <clears throat> welcome to the March 31st, 2023 meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group for Amherst. Um, we do have a quorum and let me just take a look at my list here. Are we missing anybody? Um, I don't think so. Cool. Great. Okay. Um, great. So um, my notes have it that Laura, are you able to do? Yep, I'm good. Super. Thank you. Um, Janet, thank you for minutes last time. I and didn't which I may be still being done. I don't, I don't think we got those to review yet. No, I was sick, but I'll have it next time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hope you're feeling better. Um, and as I like to do to get people <laughs> prepared, uh, next time, uh, Bob, you're back up for minutes. Today, right? No, no, no. Uh, for uh, next two weeks from now. Uh, Laura's up today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, pa no panic today. <laughs> but that way you don't have. I to was panic. actually prepared. Okay, so in, two, in uh, next time you're next time you're you're up, Bob. But uh, Laura, you'll go today. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Oh, we're missing uh, Chris, but I presume she'll be joining us um, later. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is Jack. Um, I just plopped my laptop into this docking station and the video is not working so but i'm here so i'll try to figure out the video part okay yeah no no worries we can hear okay. you um and um i miss your sunflowers but uh, another 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 background oh well okay um and let me just um check to see in terms of any public participants, we do have uh, five and 10 attendees. So thank you uh, to the public for your attendance as well. And we'll get on with the agenda now. Um, which is um, first up on the agenda is our review of the minutes and approval, if we can. Um, we do have the minutes from uh, still to review and approve for, from uh, March 3rd. Uh, uh, despite the agenda, we don't have the minutes yet to review from March 17th. But um, does anybody have any questions, comments, suggested edits for the minutes of March 3rd? They were good. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I was just looking at them and who do we need to thank for those? Uh, is Jack. Yep, yeah, thank you. Oh, the sunflowers are back. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, any comments or, or thoughts or emotion to accept the minutes of March 3rd? Bob, I'll move to adopt the minutes. All right. Thank you, Bob. I'll second. Thank you, Martha. Okay, and by voice vote, in no order, McGowan? Um, yes. Breger? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Hanner? <laughs> yes. Corcoran? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, our staff updates, which would be, um, Stephanie, if you have any for us. Sure, uh, just a few quickly. Today is the last day for people to participate in the solar survey. Right. Um, everyone has received um, links. It's also on Engage Amherst is probably the easiest place to find it. Um, so we encourage people who haven't completed that yet to please, please do so. Um, to date, there are over 500 that have been completed. So 
Um, we really appreciate people who have taken the time and would really appreciate more people doing so as well. Engage Amherst will also allow you an opportunity to make a, an extended comment that isn't just a multiple choice question. So if people wanted to leave comments, please do so because those will be incorporated into the report, uh, the final report by GZA. Um, and then my other update is that I did send it out to you all, but the governor did sign the legislation to extend remote meeting participation. So our next meeting will be remote as it has been. That will not change until, and that's extended to March 20, I'm sorry, March 31st until 2025. Yeah. When we'll learn again what our fate is. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's good news. Okay, anything else? One, one question, yep. Stephanie. Um, sure. The extended period for uh, providing comments to the survey or responding would go till when? Today's the last day, but you mentioned something about an extension. Oh, I'm sorry. That The extension is for the remote meeting participation. Okay, got it. Um, so remote meetings, we can, we are, we're extended until March oh, 31st okay. of 2025. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then uh, also, I guess I, our last meeting was on the 17th. So uh, just a quick update on the um, outreach, the community outreach. There were approximately 25 or so people who participated in the events at the Woodbury Room. There were uh, 21 people who attended the virtual presentation by GZA. And so there were lots of um, comments uh, that were collected as part of that initial outreach. And again, um, a lot of great conversations with people. Um, and I think GZA did a really nice job of sort of having it laid out so that it was um, very much um, a kind of self-service. You could walk in and just do what you, if you wanted to do one, you know, um, of the of the displays, you could you could participate in one or you could do all of them. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Janet? When, when will we get the results of the survey from GZA and the, and the comments? In April. That's all part of the report. All of that will be included in the report. Great. Um, will, we, will we get a chance to see the maps before they go into the final report? And um, There is a map. You, I don't know which maps you're referring to. Um, the solar assessment is just one map. The map you've she's, you've already seen that base map. That base map is the map that is the result of the solar assessment. Then, at the end of April, and as I said, that map was going to our GAS expert, and he it's going to be the map that's going to be available. The solar uh, assessment map is going to be available on the town's website, and different layers will be available for people to turn on and off. So that's just the base map but the final map is actually on the town's website and that will be available in April. I mean, I guess I'm confused, but it, will there be a, an overlay of agricultural soils that people could look at on that base map or final map? Um, I can't remember. I'd have to look if that was one of the, there were a few um, additional layers that were, the town was asked to, to be able to, um, include. So I'll have to take a, a, a look at that again. I, I mean, the base map is all the assessment was set out to do. They did what they were meant to do. So so the map that, that I mean, we saw that in a very like hard to see the detail form. So. Right, because it's not the final product. The final product is, is available in April that will be on the town's website and you'll be able to turn layers on and off. And I just have to go back to recall, I think there were a list, I don't know, Dwayne or Chris might even recall during our meetings, which layers were requested. Yeah, so, I think agricultural soils would be really critical to what we're, our work I'm here. I'm I, I'm not gonna say definitively, but I don't know, Dwayne, if you recall, but- Not offhand. Um, I'd have to look at that list, but the layers will be available and it's just a matter of if if that layer exists, because that they didn't assess every parcel for which is prime agriculture land that wasn't that wasn't what their assessment was specifically um, meant to um, sort of hone down to that detail of every grid because remember they were looking at each grid, but they were only assessing it on the grid, not the whole parcel. So. So I guess I'm completely lost because maybe I, I, so 
there are different overlays on the Correct. Grid. that you can turn on and off there there is when you have the map so when you when you get that solar assessment map and you go to it there's going to be different layers that you can turn on and off so if you wanted <laughs> to identify different features you can turn them on and off and, so then, and those layers steps. have nothing to do with the solar assessment. Those layers yeah. are other GIS layers that that um, are available. Right. So if there's if agricultural soils are available, we could just turn those on and off. Yeah. If if it's that specific level of detail, I, and again, I just have to double check if that I, I don't be because I don't. I mean, it would have to be like a state. There would have to be some kind of state layer that has prime agricultural land identified and that's how that. then I if we do then that's a layer you can turn on okay so as long as we i mean if it's something that it already exists they didn't they weren't creating a specific other layer to do that i guess is what i'm trying to say okay yeah their map is is mass gis capable right or, or com com right uh, compatible uh, compatible compatible right okay we had um so, Martha and then Chris and then Laura, I think. Yeah. Well, once once the GZA is finished and the our experts have you know done the overlays, I think it's really critically important that we have one or a few presentations and discussions here in our open meeting about the overlays and the salient points of the of the of the maps and the conclusions from them and so on. I think that's really important. I mean, Dwayne, maybe you and Stephanie are really conversant with how to look at the maps uh, on your own time and so on, but maybe the rest of us, including me, aren't necessarily. And it would be very helpful to be able to discuss them and you know what was going to be relevant to the actual bylaw. So I hope we can we can do that now that we've got the leisure of 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 an extended deadline, we'd, we'd have time in May to, to do that. Um, there will be a presentation by GZA of the final report, but yeah. I don't know that that would include specifically working with the map, but we could, you know, that's not a hard thing for us to do during a meeting. I yeah. mean, we can easily yeah. just have a session on using the map. So, yes. and yes. it shouldn't even take that long. Yeah, but, but that, even more more than even a tutorial on how to use the map would then be studying the map and say, ah, you know, here's the land that's been identified as prime land, or here's the land that's excluded, or you know, really go around the map and and study where where the potential solar locations are. I think that would be very helpful. I, I'd say, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of this work has been done. Uh, for us to have a tool to use uh, in our deliberation. So I, I would agree with that. I, I would be a little bit cautious in that I don't think it's our purview or desire to start looking parcel by parcel, because that's not, um, uh, you know, that's not quite in our domain. Uh, but in terms of uh, just generally looking at mm -hmm. um, for the, for the, you know, apparently uh, approximately one third of Amherst, it is not otherwise prohibited for solar development if we want to start looking to get some general uh sense of of uh, uh of what remains available of what type of um soils forest cover open space uh built up space um commer industrial commercial zoning uh on the various different uh segments i think that's that's what we will uh be helpful for us to uh have that in mind as we're developing continuing to develop the uh the the bylaw yeah that's that's what i meant was was yeah. the general sense of where the areas are because that might help us in deciding uh you, you know whether we want a, a maximum size or what the setbacks should be or things like that might be helpful i think we will um we'll try to because that's not going to be until the end of april we won't get into right. that until may um, yeah. And we'll, we will want to start discussing some of those ideas and concepts um, in terms of our general perspectives from this group um, to to move forward uh, in terms of our principles. Um, uh, and then we can look at some of the data and details from the mapping a bit later. But I don't I, I, I think we and I think Chris, in terms of starting to develop some language as draft as it is and some some holes in it. Uh, we want to begin some of those conversations uh, even before we see all that 
um, detail uh, all the have had the tool available to us. All right, let me go with Jack. Um, sorry, I think I said Chris and then Jack. Well, I, so I, 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 I would I defer to Chris. Uh, do you want to go, uh, Jack? Yes, I'll let Chris go. Oh, I just wanted to comment on what I understood was um, in the maps. The maps that we have now show areas that we don't think are feasible for solar and areas that we do think are feasible for solar. And I believe what was mapped was slopes, and I think it's slopes under 10%, um, mm -hmm. aspect, in other words, a slope that faces south, so you have a reasonable chance of getting uh, sunlight on whatever panels you put there, um, exclusions, so anything that's owned by one of the colleges or uh, UMass, exclusions of known mapped wetlands, exclusions of roadways, exclusions of already um, APR land, exclusions of land that has already been um, put under a conservation restriction or is owned by the town or the conservation commission as conservation land, land that is owned by the state as state forest or um, park land. So, um, and then, oh, I think I mentioned roads. So I don't think that the GCA consultant mapped soils. I think that's up to us to talk about and decide. We can um, decide that we don't want to have solar arrays on prime soils, but that's a conversation that this group needs to have. Those are mapped by others. They're not, they have, as far as I know, they haven't been mapped by GCA. So we can have that conversation, but I wouldn't expect to see that in the map that comes from GCA. I think they focused on slopes, aspect, roadways, exclusions, and there may be one or two other things that Stephanie or Duane knows about. But but they didn't map absolutely everything. They didn't map, you know, this forest is better than this forest or th th things like that. They did map land use. So just to be clear, land use was identified. So if it's forested or agricultural, that was identified. Um, and as um, Adrian pointed out when she did the presentation, it was just very hard to see because of the scale. It was a PDF that she was viewing because it wasn't that we weren't looking at the final product. We were just sort of looking at the base layer that will be used for RGIS to put together, you know, the other, you know, the sort of that's the base map that's used, but then you can turn the other layers on over that. And these are layers that already exist. So they're there is the, I think there's more information that you're looking for. It's just that it wasn't, they were just identifying land use. All right. And thanks, Dan, for the link in the chat, which I, I didn't think we had chat, but somehow oh. he, he hacked oh. in. Yeah. We're, yeah, yeah. So, I, and I have to ask you not to use that beyond mm -hmm. the, that feature, but go ahead, Dan. Oh, okay. I was, I was just wanting to add um, the, the farmland soil classifications are publicly available from the USDA. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think that, that would be very hard for GZA to add as a layer to the map. Well, and the town, for the GZA town to do. To GZA is oh, not doing anymore. Oh, the, the, sorry. I just yeah, want to be clear about that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, great. Uh, Jack, please. Yes. Um, let me lower my hand. Uh, I just, um, like, Dave Zomag was here, was it last week? Mm-hmm. Okay, so anyway, the, the open uh, space and recreation plan, um, the areas on there, I don't know that every that all these layers that we have uh, are are on the GIS system versus, you know, some of the stuff I think on that open space and recreation plan, I, I think are, are, are more static and not necessarily on the GIS system. Uh, you know, and so I'm not clear on that. Maybe Chris or Stephanie can check on that. I mean, it because I remember that's why I was confused because I was looking at certain things that are uh, more zoning related, and I'm not sure that's on our on the JS. I know we have printed versions, we have colored maps and things like that, but I'm not sure we can toggle, you know, all the layers that we've seen. 
and that all the layers are 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 have a GIS uh, a layer to them uh, within the the town sponsored uh, website. So that's just something I don't know, Chris. If, 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 am I wrong or? You want me to answer? Yes, Wait. please. So the town has a GIS viewer that has a limited um, number of things that it shows. And the town chose to show that limited number of things because those were things that they felt that the public would be most interested in on an ongoing basis. Others here, and I believe Stephanie is one of them, um, Aaron Jacques, um, other people in the planning department have access to ArcGIS, which is much more full and robust and has all kinds of information, but all of that information is not um, reflected in the GIS viewer that we have online that's available to the public. Okay, that's good to know. So, all right, good. And, yeah, go ahead, Jack. Well, I'm just wondering if, if at some level, without a lot of work on anybody's part, if it could just like have, you know, just have the maps like that are in the open space and recreation plan, uh, you know, digitized, just not not selected pieces of the units there, but just the color, you know, picture of the of the affected properties. And if I brought up one of their figures, um, for example, there, well, you have uh, map five, Senec resources and unique uh, features it just has the, you know, the AC uh, wildlife sanctuary and grassland. So it's just a, it's just a block, but it just, I would think you, without a whole lot of work, you just could get this stuff digitized and not where you turn off the individual units of the, you know, forest reserve versus the re riparian corridors versus Mount Holy. But just have it all together as if one layer. It'd be nice is, is my thought. All right, good. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, I just wanted to say we can ask, but I don't think we can make any promises because what sometimes seems like a simple request, especially in dealing with the GIS information, may not be, especially when you're talking about having them sort of together as one layer, that might be a bit more complicated. So I think we can certainly make the request, but I'm not going to make any promises because <laughs> um, we want to keep our GIS person. <laughs> Yeah, well, but, so no digitizing. I'm just thinking like you capture the figure and you just, and it's just, it's just an overlay. You don't, there's no work involved other than scaling, but just, you know, very kind of a, a approximate sort of thing, cartoonish. Uh, but it'd be nice, I think, to have some of these things in it, GIS format. Agreed, it would be nice. We'll find out what we are capable of being able to produce. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. And I think, um, keep in mind, we're still in staff updates. <laughs> um, and I think we're getting into some some of the um, discussion that we might hold for later in terms of, uh, um, you know, the work ahead and, and sort of how we want to approach, uh, approach the um, decisions that we have to make. Um, but um, let's go with, with Janet, and then we'll try to move on. So I, I just have two, a comment and a question. I just want to remind us that we're supposed to be doing a list of priority sites and a priority map for um, large scale arrays. So that's part of our mapping um, future. And then I have a question because I read this in the in the minutes and it said that in the excluded area was residential areas. And I had the impression that um, GZA was going to look at rooftops um, and, you know, how much solar we can get off of the rooftops. And so you know, either large buildings or residences and things like that. And I wondered if I, you know, I thought GCA was going to map the whole of Amherst, including the college's land in various areas. And so we're not going to get a sense of how much solar we can get. Will they tell you, oh, we think if, you know, with these rooftops, we can get X amount of solar energy. Is that going to happen or no? including big rooftops in the report there'll be more analysis within the report so you have to wait the report it's not going to just show up in the map the report will explain all of that and the college lands were never included to be included yeah. we said so that right from the outset that they were excluded we have no control over those 
and they have but their it, own plans. But, but it the, will include rooftops? For, it yes. includes rooftops that are outside of those okay. areas that we blacked yeah. out. Yeah. Anything that's not blacked out, rooftops were included. It's just hard to see on the scale because again, it was a PDF, it was small, but all of that will be in the report. That's that's what the report is going to provide you with is a, a more analysis and a breakdown of what's potentially available in those different categories okay. including larger roofs and and uh parking lots to the extent that we have them that are not at the um, university and colleges okay um great laura yeah one quick question or one question uh no wasn't there a assessment done in the past of the amount of solar that we could put on rooftops in the community. I, I thought that study had been conducted already. There was um, one that was done, but I don't, it was a very limited one that I was involved in. If there was something that somebody else did, I'm not aware. Um, but the one that we had done more recently was a very um, kind of more narrow investigation. And is that the niche engineering report that you're referring to? I have to go back and look. Which one, what did that en encompass, Stephanie, remind me? So again, I think that was just looking at, um, it, it was, again, I think it was a very limited uh, investigation for rooftop solar, I believe paired with battery storage and it was very limited to some specific sites and then we had another cadmus solar assessment that was also very narrow in scale okay. it didn't look townwide it only looked at specific properties and Got parcels it. that the town had um is the cadmus what I was thinking over. about okay so that was a limited it's study. very limited it was not i mean it was wide. detailed but it was just focused on um uh, relatively few uh town owned sites it was just town land. Understood. Correct. Okay. Correct. And it wasn't really land. It was, I think it was just, uh, it, it was rooftops. rooftops and parking lots. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. All right. Thanks. All right. Good. Uh, Chris? I just wanted to say one more thing, which is that GZA was hired to do a map of feasible places to put solar. They weren't mm -hmm. making any judgments. They weren't um, reflecting the town values. They were just making a map of feasible places. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, um, Chris, obviously um, you'll be running the show in a moment with regard to the uh, the zoning update, uh, zoning lang uh, bylaw language uh, crafted as well as some questions that we want to start deliberating on as a group but uh, otherwise do you have any staff updates yes i have some very good news which is that we have on board a new planner so that's going to make a tremendous amount of difference to us and we will not be as um, torn in many different directions and hopefully we'll be able to uh, do our work in a timely manner and pay attention to the things we need to pay attention to. So I'm going to say hooray, hooray, because yeah. we have our new planner. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, great to hear. Uh, and congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that person, uh, can you name that person or don't you want to be quite yet? Oh, sure. Yes, I can name him. He's here. His name is Rob Wachilla, W-A-T-C-H-I-L-L-A. -L -L and he's taking, for now, he's taking Maureen Pollock's position. He's dealing with the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. And as he gets more familiar with things, he'll also be taking on um, some of the boards and committees that we support. And he'll probably be getting involved in projects. And one thing I'd like to share with you is that he, he came from Ware. And Ware currently has either 12 or 14 large-scale solar installations. So where has gotten to be kind of sophisticated about how to deal with these things? They have um, a solar bylaw that they put in place in 2015. Um, Rob has worked with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on a bylaw having to do with battery storage. So he's going to be helpful in that regard. So I've been kind of picking his brain about what they did in Ware, and he sent me a copy of the Ware um, solar bylaw. So I think he'll be a good addition in many ways, but um, I'm hoping that he will also be able to help us out with the uh, with the solar bylaw that we're working on. Great. Okay, there. That's that's really good news. All right. Very good. Anything else before we move forward? Mm -mm, nothing. 
Um, are we, yeah. Go ahead, Janet. Are we doing um, committee updates right now, or is that next? It was next. Yep. Oh, okay. Sorry, I don't have my agenda. Some kind of. Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. You're on cue. Any committee updates? Janet? <laughs> I don't have a planning board committee update, but a planning board member did ask me um, to see the, like, basically, they would like to see what the draft bylaw that working on. And then also, um, you know, I said, well, it's kind of in bits and pieces. And, um, but also, the person also said, you know, the, the, the planning board, he thought the planning board would rather see it earlier an early draft than just before it goes to town council when it's all baked in and so i thought that was interesting and good use useful feedback also because like the planning board like the cba works with the bylaw a lot and so a lot they might have comments about how it reads or you know different kind of things that you know from a little more um you know being practiced or tortured by the bylaw so i just wanted to pass that along great thank you for that and i think that's consistent with um Chris is thinking as well in terms of trying to um, begin to, obviously this thing's not complete yet, but it, it's in pieces, but uh, she did talk a little bit about trying to uh, organize it together as, as starting to look like a more coherent whole uh, in terms of the outline, uh, table of contents or the outline, and then, and then the uh, sections that we've had worked on so far uh, to sort of make it start looking like a, uh, um, a holistic document as opposed to the pieces. So um, I think maybe after today, or, or at the end of today's disc discussion about the um, latest drafting and so forth, we can talk about um, at what point would we be comfortable um, and Chris would be comfortable sort of sharing it um, with uh, outside this group. I just want to follow okay. up question that. Um, yeah, Laura, yeah. So I, I think it would be helpful for me to better understand the process um, and what the the group and staff agrees in terms of presenting it to town council and the planning board. Um, I have to say I was a little bit concerned because I've actually run into a few town councilors and they mentioned that some people on the committee had been speaking to them about just kind of like you know, showing them drafts of things. And I wasn't aware we were doing this, like survey questions and things like that. Um, so I just, I wanna make sure we're all aligned in terms of, I've been sort of operating under the process of, I'm not sharing anything with anyone until we decide as a group that that's what we're doing um, until we're ready to solicit feedback. So that sort of, uh, you know, guidance would be helpful for me. Um, that's an important point. Um, and um, yeah, I would tend to agree that, um, you know, we're all individuals and can voice our opinions individually, but certainly not as a group uh, until the group so decides that that's the position of the working group. Um, but um, I would like uh, maybe Stephanie, I think, may have some um, guidance for us with regard to just discussion at all outside this group. Go ahead, Stephanie. Uh, I was just going to say, I think you're... Um you know, you should certainly try to as much as possible keep your discussion within the group. But um, I was going to say there might need to be some clarification of which council we're referring to, because there's legal council that will definitely be looking at this document mm -hmm. and town council. I mean, town council. Town yeah. Council. So I think that's yeah. it goes to the, the town manager first. And my guess is the town manager is going to have legal council look at it. And then I, I'm not sure. And maybe Chris is probably more versed with the process of whether it will go to CRC before, it won't go to legal counsel until, until CRC reviews it. So Chris might be more able to, to sort of um, address that piece. But your draft goes to the town manager first. That's much I know. Why, why is that? Why is what? You know, I, I think, you know, maybe coming out of a history where the planning department would work on zoning bylaws more informally before it kind of got into a more, um, you know, there's a certain point when you submit it to the planning board, they have to act within such and such days, but there's no issue with the planning department. Planning board could look at that earlier, give feedback. And that's also often very useful, of a useful time for that. But I don't think that we're particularly limited in terms of like, we have to submit our first draft to the town manager first. I don't know where. 
I, I was talking about a, the final draft. We were, oh. we were having a few different conversations. Okay. <laughs> I was There were several points brought up. I was only addressing the difference between legal counsel and town counsel, and yeah. also that the final draft goes to the town manager. As oh. far as review of this, um, I defer to Chris as the planning director who works with the planning board. Um, I think Chris would be the one to sort of best assess how the process will work you know, easiest for all. And I defer to Chris, not to put you on the spot, but. May I ask Yeah, please, you? if you have um, some guidance for us. Yeah. yeah, so I think it would be a really good idea as we move through this to have the planning board take a look at it because they, you know, have been historically the group that works on uh, zoning amendments. I'm also planning to have Rob Mora and um, Nate Malloy in our office um, look at it, which I haven't done yet. Um, as Jana has noted, it's a, it's kind of a patchwork right now, and I wanted to have a coherent um, package to show them. But um, I think we're moving into that time. And uh, this brings up a topic that um, I don't know if Stephanie has broached with this group, but we have spoken with the town manager about the potential to extend the timeline for the group's work. And this may not be an appropriate time to talk about that, but at some point during this meeting, I think it would be a good idea to talk about that because I'm not thinking, you know, I, I think it's unrealistic to expect that everything is going to come together by the end of May. Um, and so whatever, whenever Dwayne thinks that's a worthwhile topic to bring up is fine with me, but I just wanted to mention that, that I, I am, um, I am acknowledging that it's going to be extremely challenging to get this done by the end of May. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And just to follow up on that, I, unless I'm, uh, my memory is faltering. I thought, I thought we already did express to this working group that we have received an extension from the town manager. Um, I wasn't aware of that. So thank okay, you. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, everybody should be aware of that. It's not to suggest we can, relax completely but we don't uh in part of it was that um you know obviously we're not getting the results of the survey or the gza work until late april um we're gonna have the chance to look at that through may um and uh and and obviously chris has been short-staffed as well so i think with all that the town manager did recognize um and, and the importance of this bylaw uh that um that we were up against a really un infeasible deadline um what, what is the new deadline Dwayne? Sorry, and so the new deadline maybe i need stephanie to be precise but it's the end of the summer basically september 1st i believe is the date that we identified yeah um which will you know make summer schedule scheduling of meetings a little bit more chal challenging but we'll we'll need to get our our way through that and then finish up in the uh, in the summer in late summer, if, if everybody can sort of accommodate uh, some of this in their summer schedules. Okay, uh, good. Jack? Yeah, I was just going to uh, follow up with Laura's comment. seems like there's some misinformation out in the general public about the availability of a draft. I got some feedback, and but I would like to confirm everything on the website for the Solar Bylaw Working Group is for public consumption. Mm -hmm. So uh, if people want to see, you know, drips and drabs of, of drafts that's all there for them. Good point. And we can share freely, obviously, but, you know, not discuss uh, our opinions and things like that. Uh, for, you know, pursuant to open meeting law. But anyway, it, someone told me that like the Chamber of Commerce had a, a draft. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So <laughs> what is that? I don't know. <laughs> Paper <laughs> commerce? I don't know. I, they uh, could, I guess they could download the dribs and drabs from the, um, from the we, website. We can talk about our opinions with other people in the community, not amongst ourselves. Four of us can't talk about issues that we're facing amongst ourselves, but there's no limit on our conversations with other people. We're not, that's the I, question I, of the jury that you've been saying, <laughs> you know, so. As long as they're expressed as your personal opinions, not yeah, yeah. opinion of the, of the group. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Um, all right, good. Are we good to move forward? Great. Any, uh, well, any other committee updates? Um, nothing substantial for me, CAC. Just a reminder, we have the Sustainability Festival uh, part of Stephanie's work, uh, or is Stephanie's work, um, but uh, ECAC showing up with a, uh, a booth. Uh, and so there'll be some presence from, um, from ECAC and, and uh, um, uh, questions may come up, I guess, with that group about the Solar Bylaw Working Group as well. Um, but um, um, we'll be prepared to sort of address those in generality at least. Um, Okay, any other committees that we need updates? Great. Okay, so let's move on to the um, uh, sort of the meat of the agenda, which is uh, really uh, continuing our work through the um, bylaw drafts um, and sections. Um, and Chris has prepared um, both some updates on the um, uh, Previous section, I need to find my minutes with regard to the um, the title of that. <laughs> that there was, was design standards that we looked right. at previously, and then yeah. I came up with some other uh, things in the last few days, dimensional requirements. Um, exactly. So dimensional. whatever order you'd like to look at those, um, we can look at them. Yep. Um, uh would people like to uh maybe not do a whole read through but just the highlights of, of changes and edits in the um design standards first and then move on to the dimensional standards um and we can also in the design standards uh discuss the um potential to sort of shift out some of the language uh for the language that um i drafted and uh dan was it you uh who provided some input um, who was it then? Rob, Bob. I got yes. some. Yeah, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, uh, on on um, this section that could go into that uh, into that language with regard to um, trying to maximize ecosystem services. So I guess I would su uh, suggest we start with that, Chris. Um, the, the design standards move to the dimensional stand dimension dimensions. Um, and then um, see if we have time, hopefully, to uh, start looking at and deliberating a bit on the set of questions you put forward as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Stephanie, can you bring up the design standards? Yep. It's coming up right now. So I think we've reviewed this on two different occasions. Um, the end of uh, February, middle of March. And then I made some changes based on those two, uh, based on the middle of March um, discussion. So uh, in terms of lighting, we talked about um, the, the yellow highlighted material is new. So um, lighting of solar bolt, lighting of these installations shall be directed downward and shall incorporate full cutoff fixtures to reduce light pollution unless otherwise approved by the permit granting authority. So that's what we decided on um, at our last meeting. Um, moving down the page, someone mentioned that there was lack of a comma. So I added a comma. Um, next page, utility connections. There were concerns about this. I did read a number of different um, solar bylaws within the last week or two. And I would say all of them um, strongly encourage having the utility connections underground. So we're not out in, you know, left field about this. Um, but what we said last time is where technically and economically feasible, reasonable efforts shall be made to place utility connections from the solar photovoltaic installation underground. Um, and we decided to uh, delete the last sentence because we thought it was superfluous. Um, but Laura was going to look into that. I'm not sure if Laura's had a chance to do that yet, but in any event, um, that's what we came up with for utility connections. I think this is all reasonable language. Anybody have a question about that? Um, in terms of glare, I did send an email to KP Law about a question that had been um, raised by a Dan and um, 
Dan's question was, if the solar installation is put in place and then someone comes and builds a house next to it and it, you know complains about the glare, does that person have um, you know grounds for uh, for action? I guess. And the answer I got back from KP Law was really well. Someone who comes and builds a house next to a solar installation should be aware that the solar installation is uh, is there and should you know take into account what the impact of that might be. In other words, um, there is a phrase called coming to the nuisance, which um, describes this situation. You're, you're coming to a situation where there is potential nuisance. You weren't there before the nuisance was put in place. You're coming afterwards. So you should be sort of aware that these issues may, um, may occur. It's like sort of like buyer beware. So KP Law's assessment was, yeah, the person who builds the house doesn't really have too much of a leg to stand on. Although, you know, if obviously if there's anything that can be done by the solar owner to mitigate that issue, then, you know, that would be good, but they probably aren't going to be able to sue the, the solar owner. Or how could I say this? No, they're not going to be able to win a lawsuit. They can always sue. So that was the answer to that question. Does anyone have other questions about that? Martha has her hand up. Yeah. I received a, a question or comment from a member of the public asking, what about upward glare? Was there ever a case where upward glare would impact um, low flying aircraft, particularly, I guess, private planes that tend to fly lower and have an impact on the pilot's ability to see? Has that ever been a, a question or an issue anywhere? That may be a question for Laura. Yeah. yeah. So anytime you have a solar project that's in any kind of um, airway, you will have an FAA study It's required. So um, that's a, an important one and you'll never get your permit um, unless you have that study in place. Uh -huh. But those are very specifically specific areas that the FAA determines. Uh, Correct. In terms of, um, um, you know, flyways to, to and from airports uh, that are designated not for your me me meandering, um, low flying, uh, oh, yeah. uh, okay. lightweight flying vehicle, <laughs> yeah. or hot air balloon. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Janet. Did all those Air Force planes be impacted? The ones that that fly quite low over Amherst quite frequently. That would, that would absolutely be included in an FAA study. Um, yeah. Any military planes, for sure. Hmm. Yep. All right, good. So, I, I mean, my sense is our, I, our bylaw doesn't need to address that because it's going to be addressed at the federal level. Okay, um, moving on down. We talked a lot about visual impact. We're not really clear exactly how much we want to include about that, but we have a section. If we want to include it, it's there. Um, on fencing, we're making the statement that we acknowledge that appropriate um, measures shall be taken. And really, this is based on the owner of the project that they would like to put in. They want to put in fencing appropriate measures taken to prevent the solar arrays from being damaged or tampered with. And then we're saying, um, the need for fencing shall be determined by the applicant unless such fencing is needed to comply with town bylaws and or as required by the National Electrical Code or state regulations. If installed, such fencing shall be no more than eight feet tall unless permitted by the permit granting authority, shall be placed at least six to nine inches off the ground, I haven't quite determined which one we want to say there insufficient portions of the fence to allow migration of small wildlife. So in other words, we're not expecting, you know, herds of moose to come through here. We're expecting that they, there would be, you know, rabbits or, um, you know, whatever kinds of small wildlife we have in the forest and that those would be allowed to traverse under the fence, but other larger animals probably wouldn't um, be able to do that. So um, does anyone have any questions about that? Yeah. I I would just say on, on my end, I that was sort of an area that I I would propose for discussion that that language is taken out here and, and, and out from here and and that a more general um, requirement with regard to uh, maximizing ecosystem services um, 
as a design feature be be included as a separate requirement um, again for for discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, Shootsbury had a requirement that the color of the fence be black, and black fencing is really expensive because it's essentially um, you know a chain link fence, zinc coated chain link fence, but then it has an extra coating of um, vinyl on it. And so if you're talking about a vinyl covered fence that's hundreds of feet long, you're really talking about a big expense. But I'm bringing this up because Shootsbury has it in their bylaw. So is that something Amherst wants to have? Um, if you did want to have it, it might be better to say that where fencing is visible from a roadway, that it, that it should be black. So I guess I wanted some feedback from this group about whether that's um, a reasonable requirement and you know where you think it should be. Uh, I don't know who is first, but uh, Martha. Okay, if you want feedback, my, my feedback would be that I don't think that's important at all. We have so many other requirements that are higher priority. I would recommend dropping that requirement for the color of the fencing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had a few thoughts. One of them was, you know, it seems to me that you'd like the fence to be seen by wildlife so they don't run into it. Um, so that was kind of, and I, I assume if you're buffering, if you have a vegetative buffer that buffers it, you know, year round, that should take care of the, the fence and the look of it. But maybe that's, you know, I hope that's the result. Um, and then in terms of like expense, so, so, you know, if you said to me, you know, we'd like you to put, you know, black vinyl fencing, you know, on, you know, a, a square mile of, you know, a half square mile or something, that's a lot of money for me, but I never have an understanding of what the profitability of these solar arrays are. So if you're pulling out, you know, $50,000 a year in profit, half a million, five million, you know, the, what's expensive is very relative. and so. I feel almost in the complete dark about how profitable these different arrays are. And so if we're saying we want all the um, lines to be underground and someone says, well, it's too expensive, then you have to tell me how much you expect to make from this. So I, I just feel like that, that financing or the profitability part to me is just like a black box. And so I would like to know more when someone says this is too expensive, I'd like to know how much someone's, in, you know, the, what the profitability would be. And I just, not, not in a mean way, but I've been wondering this the whole time we've been sitting here. Yes. Um, yeah, good. Um, yeah, Laura. I'm going to say, I just want to um, note that I, I agree with Martha in that I don't see a, a need to put up further obstacles or aesthetic requirements like this for solar farms. Black fencing is very expensive. Um, and I don't, you know, typically the farms are buffered by landscaping and so forth. Um, and, you know, I think a requirement for black fencing just somehow strikes me as elitist. So um, I would, uh, I, I'm agreeing with Martha there. All right, good. Thank you, Laura. Okay. okay. Moving yeah. on. Uh, let's see. Um, Yes. Applicants, so this has to do with planting and screening. Applicants are encouraged to install plantings within the array. We had said below the array, but people said, well, you might want to have it elsewhere in the array, including native species, pollinator-friendly species, and species that are supportive of wildlife, rather than installing non-vegetative materials such as stone mulch, unless otherwise permitted by the permit granting authority. So there may be some reason why um, you might want to have something other than planting below this array in certain places. So that would be a negotiation between the permit granting authority and the um, applicant. Um, and then I think Duane said that there were specific requirements and practices that the state had with regard to solar arrays. Um, and an incentive structure to encourage the planting of plants and pollinator species. I haven't had time to look up th that information, but if Duane has access to it, maybe he could send it to me. 
Yeah, they do have incentive. It's not, it's, you know, again, it's not a requirement um, uh, for developers to, 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 uh, to do this planting, but there's an uh, incentive mm -hmm. for those that choose to do so. Okay. Ready? Um, what else? Okay. So let's see, control of vegetation, synthetic herbicides and pesticides may not be used to control vegetation or animals except as otherwise approved by the permit granting authority. Um, so the thing that I noted here was that um, the permit granting authority would look positively on solar installations that include agrivoltaics. Now, I'm not sure why I put that there. That Oh, I know, because this is under the topic of dual use. And this should be perhaps moved elsewhere in this um, patchwork of things that we're working on. So in any event, this was something we talked about last time. We had said give preference, but that indicates some sort of competition between one company and another. And that doesn't really make sense in this, in this uh, application process. So Laura suggested the wording look positively on installations that include agrivoltaics. And I think that's reasonable. But again, we may want to put something about dual use elsewhere, which I think I may have done in the draft that I sent out last night. So that's as far as I got with, um, or that's you know how I have uh, altered, edited this section that we looked at in the middle of March. So now we could move on to a section that I just wrote this week, which has to do with dimensional requirements. Oh, and Jack has sorry, bear with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, before we go there, uh, Jack. Yeah, I was just uh, curious about vegetation control. Maybe Laura can shed some light. But like for a landfill, uh, they're required. Uh, you know, they don't want trees on the landfill to to impact the cover, and so you know, usually they got they have to mow you know once uh, or at least twice a year. Is that sort of the frequency that? Um, is being utilized for these ground mounted fields for, like, for operations and maintenance, like mowing and things like that. Yes. Yeah. So typically in the leases, there's a requirement for not letting a grass like grass get above a certain height. Um, you know, so, you know, maybe twice a year mowing or, um, when you're planting that you're planting, if you're planting closer to the arrays that you don't plant a species that, you know, exceed a certain height when they're mature. Um, requirements like that. Is that helpful, Jack? Uh, thank you. And Chris, I wouldn't. I wonder if before we go on to the the um, dimensional uh, section, if we can take a quick look at the language um, uh, to potentially add uh, and, and to discuss with regard to. Um, which is more of a design standard of, of maximizing ecosystem services. So Duane, I'm sorry, which um, document are you asking me to? Well, I would, I would, I provided this some language for consideration. Um, and then um, I will say that uh, Bob did some editing on it. So I, I think, um, it might make sense to show the version that Bob brought forward. So it already has his suggestions on there and, and comments. Okay, um, you're gonna have to give me a moment. Right. I have it up if if it's oh, helpful. If you if you could share, that would be great. Okay. All right, now everybody move to my other screen. <laughs> does, does, do people see this language with its uh, kind of yellow highlighted? Does Dwayne want to read this? Because my voice is failing and I'll save it for the next sure. section. Okay, yep, yep. And I guess the idea here was um, uh, to motivate um, the developers uh, and then solar installers to um, try to restore, make use of, of the land that they are using uh, to um, uh, maximize other services, uh, ecosystem services that are being uh, 
otherwise um, uh, lessened uh, by the fact that um, land that was previously undeveloped is now being put into solar. And there are some um, um, important and valuable ecosystem services that can be restored or provided uh, in these arrays um, with care. Uh, and uh, again, the idea was not necessarily to absolutely require it, but to re require that the applicant or the owner um, uh, demonstrates that they have a plan to maximize uh, such ecosystem services, um, uh, unless they can otherwise, uh, you know, that 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 are not um, detrimental to the system performance uh, or to the um, uh, to the um, uh, safety of the system. So uh, let me read through this and see what people think. And this would be sort of a, a, categ a category or a section in, in the design section that could then incorporate uh, some of the other language we had about fencing being off the ground uh, and, and so forth. Um, so this section, and I'll try to incorporate some of Bob's comments as we go, um, provides that uh, large-scale ground-mounted solar PV installations that involve the use of over five acres of land uh, that was not previous that was previously undeveloped. Um, so this would be you know larger scale systems that are not uh, that might be on the ground, but over a parking lot, for example, wouldn't wouldn't require this. Um, uh, shall uh, shall demonstrate to the satisfaction of the PGA and the Director of Conservation that the site plan for the entire footprint of the project seeks to maximize ecosystem services of the land to the extent feasible without substantive harm to the performance or safety of the solar project. Um, any thoughts on that? I'll keep going. Um, such plans and enabled ecosystem services, um, which again, we can get back to Bob's comments here, which are uh, important in terms of how, how are these things defined or, or do we need to define them? Um, but anyhow, uh, such plans and enabled ecosystem services shall be applicable to the surrounding natural conditions um, and may include such actions as creating small wildlife and pollinator friendly habitat, following published best practices or certification requirements, and providing appropriate and sufficient gaps in perimeter fencing at the ground to allow for small wildlife passage. It's meant to um, suggest what might be involved but not limit uh, the design to those things. Um, the plan shall demonstrate that the site will be vegetated with native species, avoid the planting or growth of invasive species. Um, to Bob's point, maybe that should be avoid the planting and manage the growth <laughs> of invasive species, avoid the use, avoid the use of, I think should be in there, of any herbicide or pesticides, and limit the mowing and limit the mowing of the site and timing of such mow, mowing to accommodate ecosystem health unless approved uh, probably should say unless otherwise approved by the PGA and and to Bob's point there yeah the the intent there I was not trying to be specific to um nesting birds but that's kind of the primary my understanding is the primary um concern about mowing at certain periods of time when nesting is uh is is going on um, the applicant or project owner shall, um, and I'll go with uh, Bob's suggestions here, uh, shall assure the ecosystem services plan is implemented throughout the project life and shall report annually to the PGA of the status and actions taken to demonstrate the implementation of the plan and to the extent that the site is failing to meet the ecosystem services objectives, the applicant or owner shall specify and propose remedial actions to be approved by the PGA and take such actions to further these objectives. Um, so, try to um, have language that requires that this is given um, deep thought 
and, and good thought by the applicant. Um, if there's reasons that it can't be done, there's that are legitimate and approved by the town. Um, if PGA, there's an out. Uh, but otherwise, um, you got uh, let, let's let's use the land uh, for some. Uh, let's assure that the land provides some value for ecosystem services as well. Um, so interested in comments on the concept as well as specifics of the language. Um, Martha had her hand up first. Yeah, okay, I didn't get the order, but uh, we'll go with Martha. Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, th I think this is great and the overall intention is great. I didn't have a chance to read it be, you know, since you sent it. And I think the wording tends to be a bit vague. I don't know whether everyone even knows what the meaning of ecosystem services is, but uh, maybe if we have a little chance to, to think about it and reread it, we could uh, you know, polish the wording a little more. I would be in favor of putting in specifically about the timing of the mowing versus nesting birds. I, I think that would be better than just saying timing of mowing for ecosystem services there. Um, but I, there are a few other places where maybe some uh, some more little more specific language could be, but I like the overall uh, tone and intention of it. Thank you. Good, thanks. Um, Jack and then Janet. Yeah, I, I'm, um, again, the definition, I when I read this eco ecosystem services just made me think about, <laughs> I don't know, HVAC or something, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm wondering about like, is that standard language that you call it services versus like functionality or. Uh, I, I've been hearing it all over. So I don't, I don't know exactly if it's it is. Okay. Or, or what. <laughs> but, all right. Yeah. If maybe that's what it worth, is. then Well, maybe it's worth, um, investigating and seeing if there's any actual definitions out there that are yeah. that are um sufficient sufficient more specific but specific but specific but sufficiently vague to be um incorporate the types of things we're looking for okay all right good janet and then laura so i i agree with um jack and um, martha I thought that the um, eco service, ecosystem services could be in our definition section. And I know both the 2025-2030 um, Climate Action Plan and the Towns Act Climate Action Plan list, you know, define the ecosystem services in the sense that they list all the possible services provided by open land. And so that might be useful because it just saying it is so broad, like, I don't know, if we're talking about grass or sequestration or, you know, like, I don't know what, you know, producing, producing oxygen, you know, so I just thought that that should be defined and probably in a definition section. Um, I also didn't really know what, uh, I, I also wondered what previously undeveloped land kind of that definition in a town that's like, you know, we're 400 years old in an ecosystem that was used before we were here, like the, the colonists came. And so I just kind of thought, is a farm previously undeveloped or if it was bad? I just, I just thought that was really vague too. But I do like the idea of it, of trying to maximize the ecological benefits. And I also wondered why, like, shouldn't every array do that at some level? Like not every single one, but like is five acres the tipping point or is three, would you, you know what I mean? I wondered if we should just, require this for everything or just be very specific like oh we want native grasses and mowing you know just to to do that um so that was and so because one of the questions i had was you know at the end it says to meet the ecosystem services objectives and you know if you don't know what you're going for and you don't know you know if, you, if you're not very specific about what your objectives are or what services you want to maintain then you can't really say you know, I met them or the plan meets them and things like that. So, so I, I do think it needs to be sort of tightened and clarified, but I did like the idea of it very much so. All right, thank you. Laura, appreciate yeah, your- I was going to say, your, um, thanks, uh, Dwayne and Robert, for this section. I think it, I think it's a nice addition. Um, I totally understand what you mean by ecosystem services, and I agree with others in, in defining it, because I think there's a lot of, a lot of good benefit here. And when I'm reading this section, um, 
you know, I think there's nothing but upside um, in terms of including this language. Um, my only thought is, and I don't think we're making it so prohibitive, but what I have found is that sometimes those quick, I don't know what the small trees were called, but those quick growing like tall, thin trees that you see, they're conifers that you see in Italy a lot, um, maybe not, but that grow on the outside of the solar fence. I don't believe those are native, but the, you know, sometimes I just wonder if the, if the um, landscape architecture that will want to hide a solar array might not always be native. So, um, and of course it's not invasive, but um, cause I think that's great to ban that, but um, I just wanna just make sure we're not shooting ourselves in the foot before we get started here. Gotcha, yep. All right, good. Um, Janet, and then uh, maybe we can move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a very quick thing. I thought you should delete the phrase without substantive harm to the performance or safety of the project, the solar project, because I think you basically said, when you say to the extent feasible, you could just end it there because if it's, you know, like that kind of says what you're saying. And I just thought that longer clause is something maybe more to argue about in a way like, well, is it substantive harm or is it mild harm or is it unsafe? The project doesn't say for it's substantive, you know, I mean, I just thought in a weird way, if it's infeasible and it's not going to work, the, the, the planning board or the ZBA is going to, you know, know that and not say, well, we're not going to require you to do blah, 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 if you can't do it kind of thing. So I thought just sort of maybe, I don't know, I just thought that that extra phrase might be something to like start dickering over more than just it doesn't work. Just yeah, I guess my, my thought there was that um, you want to max, maximize the extent feasible the ecosystem services uh, and that that, oh, itself, oh, that might that itself might be planting tall trees <laughs> or something. Yeah. Um, that would then be uh, oh, I see what you're saying on the on the array. I thought it was as feasible, you know, with the array. So maybe that's just, you know, okay. Okay, I'd thanks. put it the other way. All right, okay. Uh, Laura, did you have a comment on that or you you put your hand back down? Which no, is, I'm good. Okay. Busy writing over here. Oh yeah, right, okay. Sorry. All right, okay, good. Uh, so um, we can work on on sort of reflecting on, uh, on uh, these comments, Bob's comments are in here and uh and have something um revised to to uh put into the into this um i think would be the design section um stephanie sorry i'm looking at this language i just um i'm wondering at the beginning where you say um demonstrate to the satisfaction of the program granting authority, a permitting granting authority and the director of conservation. I'm not sure that that's actually the accurate pathway. So I think we would want to investigate that because it might be, in some cases, it might be the conservation commission. So I just thought that might be something that Chris or I could look into. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, I figured the PGA may not have sort of expertise in this particular area. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Great. May I just ask that oh, yeah, um, you forward this to us because I didn't check my email. Maybe I've already received it, this, but I don't remember having received it. Uh, so, um, it, it was sorry. but I can I can make sure Chris gets it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank great. you. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Great. Um, let's then move on to the new section um, that Chris has um, drafted for us on, um, uh, what was it, dimensional, I think is the term? Dimensional, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me stop sharing. Okay, just give me one moment here. Did we just get this today, this morning? I think so. Or maybe you oh, got it last night. Yeah, I apologize. I, Things it, have been very um, challenging here. No, I don't I don't blame you. It's just, I felt like I didn't know what we were talking yeah. about. So. I think I only sent it this morning, I believe, because yeah. that's when I received it. So um, just bear with me one moment. So let me introduce this um, whole topic. 
hmm. by saying um, there are many questions that I have about what we should do or shouldn't do. And as I said, I've read through multiple um, zoning bylaws and they're all different and they're all particular to their town. On the other hand, some of them are all the same and they look like they were all, you know, um, created by one body, say Pioneer Valley Planning Commission or whatever. So I'm trying to get to what does Amherst want? And there are many questions. I sent out an email, I guess it was last week, maybe, um, where I asked a number of questions about different things. And, um, and I'd kind of like to get answers to some of those questions. But in any event, I made an attempt to start uh, writing what I think Amherst might like, Amherst might want in its bylaw. And um, so here, let's talk about these particular things, and then we can go back and talk about more general ideas. So this is a dimensional standards section, and it talks about setbacks, and it talks about an open space requirement, and I can't remember if there's anything else in here. Um, energy storage systems. Okay, so um, in terms of setbacks, um, what I have written is for large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations, the project shall have a minimum front yard setback of 100 feet. And to me, that seemed reasonable given the scale of these things, um, but others may have different ideas about that. I know that the uh, Installation along West Bay Road um, that Hampshire College has is, I believe it's closer to the front property yes. line than 100 feet. Um, people have found that to be disturbing. Some people, um, some people think it's beautiful. So in any event, that's a question. What, what do we think a front setback should be? And we are also remembering that in a previous section, we have a buffer, I believe a buffer of 50 feet of, of vegetative material. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're thinking about the 100 feet. Um, and then I thought, well, we have scenic roads in Amherst, which are actually mapped, and we should, you know, think about those in a special way. So here's my uh, my stab at that, where, where the property line runs along a, a scenic road as designated by a vote of Amherst Town Meeting in 1974 in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 15C, as shown on a map entitled Town Designated Scenic Roads, front setbacks shall be 200 feet. So um, I'm thinking about these things in light of the fact that Shootsbury actually has a front setback of 400 feet which seems excessive to me, but I'd like to hear from all of you about what do you think? And different ones of you may have different opinions on this. So um, what's your take on this about the front setback? Great, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, and let me, before we go, before we, um, get comments it looks like from janet but uh can you um is like is is every parcel is a it, it, is every parcel defined with a front and a back and a side <laughs> uh, or uh um you know i get i kind of get that idea from a house but um but even some houses it's kind of sometimes hard to tell what's the front and what's the back um that's uh, a so good point because there are properties where um, the front is actually, you know, a hundred feet from the road already because there's another parcel in between. So maybe we should say something like, "Where the front yard, when the where the front property line runs along a roadway, then the setback would be a hundred feet. If the property is away from a roadway." And the front proper front set front yard setback is not visible from the street. Maybe we do something else. So that's a good okay. question. But, but I would say you know there, there, probably a neighbor uh, deserves a bit of a setback to a, a, an adjacent property too. Um, and th and then the other question I had was when we talk about a fifty foot buffer, um, that would be for you know screening plants and so forth. Is that um, would that be within this hundred yards 
uh, or sorry, 100 feet, or is that um, 100 feet of, of nothing and then you screening and then the solar project or with the no, screen? Yeah. I think the buffer would be within the 100 feet. Yeah. Okay. It would just be where the solar array actually yeah. starts, which would probably be where the fence is. Yeah, the fence line. That's where it would be 100 feet back. And um, so, as I said, the one on Hampshire College is closer than 100 feet. Mm -hmm. um, Shootsbury has 400 feet. Yeah. Other towns have other measurements, but what do we think about this for Amherst? Yeah, okay, great. Um, Janet? Um, so I, I, I know this is a hard issue to wrestle with. In terms of the scenic road, I would just, um, just say scenic road, you know, designated in accordance with MGLC 40 section 14C because, um, you know, in case the town council wants to designate more scenic roads. Like, I, I don't know why we would limit to what we did in 1974. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's actually designated quite a few roads and, you know, so, but I just think that I would just delete that because it's sort of, it's sort of frozen in time. Mm -hmm. um, this makes me really want to go like to what an idea where I think we talked um, about in the fall is let's go visit some solar arrays because you know, for me, I would need to kind of sit and look at it and say, okay, this is a hundred foot setback. This is 300 feet, you know, to, when you're looking at a large array, it's going to have a very different impact standing in front of it than me sitting in a computer thinking about it, you know? And so I, 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 we did talk about going to see the two arrays um, with Cinda Jones, one in the North Amherst and then one in Shootsbury, which is in a forest and one's just on farmland. And she had invited us to, or invited us to meet with her solar person and so I, I just think we you know maybe with the spring not that we've had much of a winter it'd be a good time for like a Saturday site visit or something mm -hmm. and um just since we're all familiar with it and, and or could easily drive by it the Hampshire project um mm. uh, do do we know what the setback do we know how far that is from the road just to give us a Point of I do not know, but yeah. I can find out. Steve okay. would know. He's listening. Well, and Steve may chime in uh, if he's so willing uh, if, when we go to public comments. Yeah. Okay. If he knows that. Yeah. Maybe we could even ask him now to get uh, the answer. Is that kosher? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, Steve, if you have a response, do you want to just electronically raise your hand? And if you don't, you don't have to. Okay, Steve, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Hi there. Hey, Steve. Um, I, I don't know the official answer to that, but just a moment ago as this came up, I just, I'm bringing up Google Earth maps on which I can measure it. <laughs> and you want, you want to know the distance in feet, I'm guessing? Yeah. So on... Google from the Earth. front property line rather than from the edge of road, or you could give it to us from the edge of road and then we'll figure out where yeah. the property line is. I don't know what the property line is technically, but I'm looking on Bay Road just off of where um, it's kind of the closest panel, the corner from a panel to the edge of the road is shows as 44 feet. Ooh. Okay, so quite a bit less than 100. Yeah. Yes. And then it, the, the distance from the fence that surrounds the array to again like the white lo line on the side of the road is 34 feet mm -hmm. so that and that's that's just one spot um elsewhere it's a little uh, more than that on the corner that's sort of closer to the eric carl museum that's 50 feet from the corner of a panel to the edge of the road mm -hmm. Right, I, really again, I don't know what was specified when during approval process. Um, if, if I rem remember, I believe that we used the setback that was required in the dimensional table. So um, that could have been, I don't know if it's RO or RLD, but if it's RO, it would be 25 feet. So we required that to be 25 feet away from the road or from the property line. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> just in time learning. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, actually, yeah, that's actually pretty good perspective <laughs> to, to think about mm -hmm. that being, you know, 30 to 40 feet at the closest um, compared to 100 feet um, that, that uh, is 
um, proposed here by Chris. All right, Martha. Yeah, I think that, you know, my response really is so much of it depends, you know, it's hard to make a hard and fast rule. I mean, I, in some cases, like by the, by the Bay Road, by, you know, where you have just a field or something, I would think that something on the order of 50 feet would be fine. Uh, if it's next to someone's home, it would be nice to have the hundred. Uh, it really just depends on the location so much. And Dwayne, your question of what's the front. <laughs> uh, so I don't know whether we could say like 50 feet from a road, or we could then refer to some of the other dimensions in terms of, you know, if there's a private residence, uh, whether we could define things specifically that way, I don't know. But uh, I shouldn't think that it should always have to be 100 feet from a road, given the example that the one at Bay Road is more like 50 feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that uh, we can, it seems like it has some merit to define it more in terms of uh, uh, proximity to a resident um, or to a road. Um, I just remember from the wind wind um, wind work that I'd done earlier. There was there was um, rules with regard to that, uh, not so much just setbacks, but you know, so far from any um, home or residence or, or 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 occupied building. I think it was. I guess I could also just say that you know, in Massachusetts, there is discussion of putting solar panels along by roadways. So you know, but that's open land. So then that's. Yeah. So. Um, okay, uh, good. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the order here, but we'll go with Jack, Laura, and then Janet. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, good comments by Martha. Um, I guess I'm in the, it depends camp as well, but, um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, the hundred, I always thought it'd be, a, you know, about a hundred feet, but you know, 50 feet sounds reasonable. I, the 400 feet, I can't, I can't put my arms around that. That seems <laughs> uh, a bridge too far, but with regard to this, the scenic road, I'm just wondering if, if the, where we have spoken about doing the visual analysis where something like that uh, kind of calls out for, well, let's look and see it is, is the slope going up uh, where the solar ray is going to be down? So we, from the roadway that you actually see it, or is going to descend where it doesn't really make a difference sort of thing. Um, but the comment that, that Martha said about, you know, roadways or, you know, medians and things like that, or like where, we, you know, those are ideal parts, but we don't really have, you know, off the top of my head that we have that situation, but yeah, there's, there's some things to think about here. Good, thank you. Uh, what do I say, who do I say next? I'm sorry. Mar uh, Laura. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, just real quickly. Um, so, I, I, you know, you mentioned the, um, the wind farms you've worked on before, and I did a lot of work in wind um, years ago, too, and those setbacks were required for safety purposes um, and because yeah. of, yeah, because of the technology, mm -hmm. um, and, and solar doesn't obviously present any of those similar safety concerns, um, so I, I, um, I think it was really helpful to hear you know, the actual setback for the, for the, you know, 15 feet for the, the Bay Road farm because versus 100 feet. And I, I don't know how to capture that in the language, but, you know, it's very different. I feel if you have a solar array on a scenic highway, you know, I remember when I was working in Virginia, we were like, we did a whole GIS, this is years ago in grad school, we did a uh, we built a GIS tool, and of course, when you're building, you know, when you're talking about the Blue Ridge Parkway, it's very different than when you're talking about off of Route 81, um, <laughs> because it's just a totally different dynamic. So I don't know how to capture that, but um, I think it's important um, for our for our bylaw. Good. Um... 
yeah, maybe um, if, if you can hold on just a second, Janet, is um, uh, just following up on that. I, I, uh, Chris or anybody else, I mean, in terms of the, the, um, um, the designation of scenic roads in, in Amherst, how, how widespread are scenic roads in Amherst? Are, is, are, are, is that a lot of, I mean, we have a lot of scenic roads in Amherst, but I don't know if they're have, at the extent to which um, the designation is is uh, um, covers a lot of, of, of roads. Yeah, um, there is a map. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think it's on the planning board webpage. And um, let me see if I can find it. I'm not going to be able to find it yeah. in the okay. time that I need, but I can I can um, circulate it if okay. people want to see it, and that would be a good thing for next time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, Janet. So, so I actually disagree with Martha, respectfully, of course. Um, I think the Bay Road um, solar array is way too close to the road, and you know it wouldn't even give you 50 feet of a buffer. And when I, when I, that, that array to me just takes over the whole view. I think Bay Road is a scenic road and I would have loved to have seen that pushed back more um, and maybe buffered, but it, to me, it's like the purpose of having a scenic road is the scenery and it's kind of a tourist attraction. It's a, it's, it's a recreational thing. It, it's people enjoy it. I live on a scenic road. Um, I can't tell you how many bikers come down that road, you know, in groups of 40, you know, all fall and spring long and summer. Um, so I, I do think that these are decent, these are good numbers. I still would like to see them sort of in practice. Um, and then I know Daniel has brought this up about is does a solar survey ask this question about scenic roads or setbacks or give a sense of where people I, I don't recall. I remember that question about I was actually going to actually get back to you because like, someone else called. So that, that was my basic thing. Is it I think that these are good news. Yeah, good. Thank you, board. Janet. So the planning board approved that. Okay, are we ready to move on? Um, let's just go with Jack and then we'll move on. Yeah, I, I just want to say uh, with regard to the, the Hampshire College one, I, I, I live a stone's throw from there. And I, um, again, <clears throat> I didn't really even notice it was there for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> so I guess difference in opinion, but I just wanted to say that that, that one really doesn't uh, seem, uh, again, if I didn't notice it for a period of time, uh, it doesn't seem to be obtrusive. But. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we'll go with Bob and then and then move on. So I, two things. One, I just pulled up the scenic roads, and I assumed it was Northeast and Southeast Street, but there are a lot of them on there. Middle Street, uh, Snell Street, some of them I can't believe are scenic roads. I think in 74, they probably were. <laughs> and the other thing, I also live a stone's throw from Hampshire College, and I have to agree with Jack. I hardly noticed it. I thought Chris had a good observation. At that time, they used the zoning I don't know the ter terminology, but the dimension table you said, I have no problems with that. Just using what we've used. Which is maybe Chris can elucidate uh, on that. Is that uh, just standard setbacks for all sorts of different and, uh, construction? It's standard setbacks for structures. Yeah. Structures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which are more on the 50 feet variety or? No, they're um, in the RLD zoning district residential uh, low density. The front setback is 30 feet, and in RO residential outlying, it's 25 feet, and in RN, which is like Echo Hill neighborhood, it's 20 feet. So they're pretty, they're far less than 100 feet. Um, now, you know, I think people have differing views of what solar arrays look like. I drive by the solar array at Hampshire College and I see this beautiful undulating wave of glass. And I think, oh, that's really beautiful. But I know we've heard from other people in town who find that offensive. So there's a broad range of views about the opinion about the way these things look. So I'm, I am trying to be, um, sensitive to the people yeah. who don't want to look at these things and try to figure out how do we make it not obtrusive. Yeah. 
All right, good. Okay, um, Bob, is your hand up again or, or um, it just hasn't gone down? Great, okay. Um, Janet, real important or should we move on? <laughs> just a little a contextual thing is that, so it's a 25 or 30 foot sit back for a two and a half story house. And so I, I think, you know, when we're talking about acre, five acre or 10 acre or 20 acre solar farm, you know, being 25 feet from the beginning of the road is very different from, a, you know, a single family house or a duplex or what, triplex or whatever you want to build. So I just think that context should be considered. And also we have to put a buffer in there and we can't put a buffer in a 25 foot setback. So I, I do think these are, if we look at other towns, fairly consistent. I guess the um, I mean, the other context in my mind is like the size of the parcel. I mean, uh, uh, if you're yeah. trying to put in an you know an array to um, you yeah. know use up most of the parcel and it's a hundred feet on either side, then you might be really constraining the potential size of the project. If it's on a huge parcel, it probably doesn't matter so much. Um, so yeah. I, I'm trying to grapple with that in my mind uh, as well. Okay, so Laura. Yeah, I just want to make a quick note. I know we got to move on, but I just want to say that um, I certainly appreciate uh, Chris's comment about being sensitive to different people's opinions. I think we can all agree that, you know, um, we're all uh, very subjective in terms of how we perceive uh, the visual aesthetics of things. But I also just want to remind, you know, the reason why um, I'm here and I think the reason why we were on this committee is that, you know, the state has said pretty um, aggressive renewable energy goals. And Amherst is a part of this. So um, I think we really need to try and be reasonable about what constitutes uh, a view shed that requires protection. We, we, we need to, you know, there's gonna be a requirement to bring solar to Amherst. So um, I'm just hoping we can, you know, try and keep the emotion out of it, but also, um, you know, make smart design decisions. So, and there's a lot of landscaping that can be done. I just need to emphasize that. I've seen tremendous variation across the board. Mm -hmm. um, so good for thought. Good. Okay, let's, um, I think we've got a lot of food for thought there and Chris does as well in terms of approaches here. Um, and so let's move on to the next section. So the next section is about side and rear setbacks. Um, and not all properties are rectilinear. Some are odd shapes. So you have to imagine that side setbacks aren't going to be coming straight, necessarily straight out of the um, front setback. But in any event, um, for large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic, and I, I want to remind us that we have defined large scale uh, installations to be essentially anything over an acre. I think it's anything over 250 kilowatts, if I'm not mistaken, and that constitutes approximately an acre. So some of these aren't gonna be enormous. Some of them are gonna be relatively small. Anyway, um, for large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations, the project area shall have a minimum setback of 50 feet from other property lines, side and rear property lines. Um, so what do you think about that? I mean, my general thought is that this sort of, um, all the setbacks have to holistically be, um, you know, I think we brought up a lot of issues in the previous discussion in terms of the front, which I think applies to the sides as well, um, in terms of this notion of it all depends and how do we, how do we, yeah. how do we write something that is um, has a little bit more dependency on the situation. Um, and I don't know if there's precedent for that. Uh, um, but let's see what else um, we have, Janet. Chris, I have a question about how this ties into um, a buffer of like a, adjacent properties. Is there like a vegetative buffer requirement that we've written if there's an, a house next door? There is a vegetative buffer required that's, I believe, a 50-foot buffer. So this whole 50 feet would be filled with 
vegetation. And then, so, I mean, it's hard to picture a one acre, um, one acre of panels that would include a buffer and fencing and the setback. I mean, it seems like that just seems like a parcel that's never going to, you know, happen, you know, or it, it also just seems, seems too small to me, although I, there is an acre in front of my house. Um, so I just want, I just, I need to sort of see how those interrelate, mm -hmm. you know, and so I'm having trouble. I guess, yeah. I mean, if, if a, uh, if a, house or a farmer uh wanted to put up a 250 kilowatt ground mounted array in an acre in front of their house in a 20 acre parcel that they might have uh we wouldn't necessarily i don't think want to prohibit them from doing that um though it may be closer than 50 feet from his his or her own house <laughs> um, um I kind of yeah I feel like we just sort of think through the difference doesn't scenario. need doesn't need to have he, he or she may not want to have vegetative buffer around the whole thing uh, yeah yeah okay so, well, so. so are there other comments yeah. on this yeah Martha yeah just a quick comment I, I as I sit here thinking I really think that the setbacks and buffers depend on what's the size of the array as we just mentioned for a one acre array we may not care about big setbacks for a 20 acre array we may want bigger ones so that's something for us to think about for for the future for our final wording of things mm -hmm. yeah yeah good point okay. okay all right good yeah let's try to get through this and then we'll open it up to um and finish out the agenda yeah so the next paragraph actually there's a mistake in it it shouldn't say the 100 foot setback it should say the setback may be waived or reduced in all districts when abutting railroad tracks upon mm. the approval of the permit granting authority where site conditions allow for reduced setback without negative impact on screening mm. so mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. makes sense because people you know i guess well, anyway, I won't editorialize, <laughs> but I'm going to um, change that to take out the 100 foot part. Um, open space requirement. Now, this is something that Palmer has. Palmer has a one and a half um, times whatever area you have as your solar array. They want you to preserve one and a half times that um, area. And I think it's for clearing uh, specifically. Um, Shootsbury has a four times uh, a clearing. So if you clear, you know, 20 acres of forest in order to have a solar array, you have to have um, 80 acres of forest preserved and it has to be for the life of the uh, solar array. So this is really a question. Does Amherst want to have this kind of requirement? Do we have enough land to have this kind of requirement? Um, so let's read through it. For all projects where there is clearing of forest land, a minimal, minimum area equal to the total area of forest land that is cleared must remain as natural open space for the life of the project. This natural open space may be on the same lot as the large scale so solar photovoltaic installation, or may be on another property in Amherst owned by the same property owner. Now, there it could be another property in Massachusetts owned by the same property owner. So that's something that we can discuss. Mm -hmm. This area shall be clearly depicted on a site plan prepared by a registered land surveyor. The land designated as open space shall be deed restricted for the life of the large scale so solar photovoltaic installation. And the deed restriction shall be recorded at the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds. So do people think this is a good idea or not? Yeah, I know I'm not going to, I think we're all going to have very different opinions here, but my opinion of this is, is that this is, first of all, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel as though um, Palmer and Shootsbury are necessarily model bylaws that I would look toward um, in terms of reflecting the values of Amherst. Um, and I, I believe this requirement is overly burdensome. So I really would be curious to look at other bylaws. Um, this is just a very expensive proposal uh, um, to, you know, deed another part of forest and for the preservation of land. And I'm trying to get a sense of like, are we doing, you know, I, I, I feel conflicted about this. And I would, I would 
really like to know um, what other communities besides Palmer and Cheeseboro have one. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Laura. Um, Mar I, I didn't catch the order, so I'm going to go with Martha, Bob, Janet. Okay, so my just my views here. I, I I do think it's a good idea to include this. It's specific to forest land cleared, and it is good to say the total amount of, of forest land cleared because if somebody goes in and clears a large amount of land to have the roads and the make the construction easy, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, I'm not in favor of that. And so I, I, I do feel it is a good idea to say an equal amount. I do feel that we should specify in Amherst. And then I question, uh, it says, leave an equivalent amount of quote, natural land. Does that mean you can cut down a forest and then preserve a field? Uh, I would prefer to say, if you're cutting down a forest, you need to preserve an equal amount of forest land somewhere because that's where you're getting the carbon sequestration. And again, my view is we've got to have a balance here between uh, the solar arrays that we put up, which are a very good idea to give us fossil-free electricity and the real strong need for having the drawing down the CO2 from the atmosphere, which means the forest land. So that's my view. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, Bob. No, who who do I? Uh, Dan, uh, Dan, uh, Dan, let's go with you. Um, so I'm, I have a question for the folks who are on like the um, zoning committee. Or um, what what, is, what are the existing requirements uh, in Amherst for for non solar projects regarding? preserving forest land. Are there any at all? There are none. I, I, yeah, if okay. it was wetlands, Thanks. if it was wetlands, you might be asked, if there was some interference with the wetlands, you might be asked to set aside like four yeah. acres of wetland rights. I can, I can speak to that, yeah. So if it's um, disturbing a wetland, then you have to replicate um, on a two to one basis for, or mitigate on a two to one basis. For the impact, however, it's not specifically, you're encouraged to do it on the parcel or you could do it elsewhere in town. I was just gonna actually raise my hand to say the way this is worded actually assumes that the developer of the project has other land in Amherst. And there may be a point where someone who's proposing a project doesn't have other land in Amherst. So um, to me, I wonder how that would pass legal muster. So I'm not saying you wouldn't, I mean, I, I think to say it's other, you know, it's got to be replicated on other land that that is owned by the same property owner. If it's just other land in Amherst where, you know, I just think um, it is, it makes an assumption here. Yep. Okay, great. Um, oh, still want to. Yep, Janet and then Jack. So um, I agree with Laura about looking at other towns and um, Doug Marshall started, and not just on this issue, but the setbacks issue and the other different requirements, Doug Marshall had put together a chart looking at like Belchertown and like a couple other towns. I think Jack might remember this. And I was gonna ask if we could do that for a lot of these new requirements that we're talking about, and you know, maybe picking some sister towns like Pelham and Belchertown, or towns that are kind of like us, you know, in the Connecticut River Valley. Um, so this is like a mitigation requirement that I've seen in other um, in other bylaws. I do want to say that forest land is quite cheap per acre, so it's it may not be, you know, like you know, I, I think some other places have a one acre of forest land, ten or four times requirement. But it may, you know, since forest land is much cheaper than farmland, it may not be a really burdensome requirement. And I think the idea is, you know, it's like you've lost all the environmental services of this forest land, like much, very dramatically. And so you want to compensate for that by making sure, you know, some land is set aside. But I would, I think we should look at other towns 
um, and other, you know, other kind of things, but also for setbacks and different things like that. Because I think that would be useful and also be useful to find out, well, why did you pick this number? You know, if Belchertown picked 10 times or four times, like where did they get that number and what was their thinking? Because I, I, I have found great usefulness talking to planning directors because they've been down the road before and had the discussion or they had the experience. Great, uh, Jack. Um, who? Uh, oh, it was Stephanie that said, you know, legal ramifications of something like this. That, that's the first thing that came to mind when we, you know, we're looking at, you know, that reasonable public health, safety, or welfare justification to limit that. And then, you know, and then above that is the quality of the forest. And I, you know, I for me, you know, there's. There's good stands and there are poor stands. There, there's more, you know, like a scrub forest and there's yes. old growth forest, which I don't think that we have any in Amherst, but um, so there's this entire spectrum. And I just, I don't know that one size fits all is appropriate for this open space requirement. Uh, this is just my initial thoughts. Yeah, great. Uh, Laura, and then, and then I'll well, yeah, put in I my just, thoughts. Yeah, I wanted to <laughs> I want to just make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Um, are we actually saying that if I was a landowner in Amherst and I am going to build a project on 10 acres of land and I have to cut down two acres of forest, I am going to be required to buy another two acres of land in Amherst to set aside because of that uh, forest I've cut down? Is that what this language says? I'm not sure what the language says, but I think the intent is that um, that in this proposal that the uh, not, not necessarily the landowner, but this the the project owner, um, uh, the solar project owner would be required to um, not own not own and set aside, but to um, through a, a land trust or or some other entity um, uh, uh, enable. Um, a similar amount of land or some X times the amount of land uh, mm -hmm. to be put into preservation for at least the duration of the of the project lifetime. So they would have to own it, but they would have to um, uh, work with, I think that's usually done through land trust or some other, or maybe sure, like or something. Yeah. I guess my other follow-up question is, and I think Dan made a good point, he kind of got cut off, but do we have this requirement for any other kind of commercial development in the community? Because it just it just seems like I I I personally have never seen this requirement before. Where it's I I, I gotta under, better understand the language, but um, and perhaps I'm not reading it correctly. Um, whether it's you're paying for a conservation easement or or something, but um, I I really um, want to better understand this section. Um, my understanding is there is that, that that precedent for wetlands, but not for carbon um, issues or for forests. Um, just to add some comments on my own, um, is that I, I I think there is an issue with regard to well, we're not asking a commercial developer to do this if they cut down some forest or a home developer to find similar land. And you know, one of the differences, at least the solar project, is providing substantial carbon reductions itself. That's unlike a commercial building or a, or a home, which is actually adding uh, more carbon into the atmosphere, along with good things for the economy, but uh, more carbon to the atmosphere. I would also, um, I, I would um, not limit it to uh, property that's owned by the project, by the, by the um, property owner, because that's really limiting. I would also not limit it to Am Amherst. Um, I would also question if we're really, really trying to, well, two, two things. If we're really trying to get to the carbon reductions, um, then, um, and the carbon sequestration, um, it, it raises issues with regard to verification, but, you know, four acres uh, in, in the Amazon uh, is going to do a lot more carbon sequestration than four acres in, in, um, in, uh, um, in Amherst or the Northeast. Uh, so, um, is there an argument to be made, and it may reduce the cost of such set aside, uh, and assuming verification uh, is dealt with, uh, is there 
an argument to be to, to open this up more globally. Um, and then I would also suggest that the language that I had um, suggested with regard to maximizing ecosystem services, um, I think helps to address this issue without necessarily going to a, a separate set aside uh, because it does for for such situations where you're where it's un, 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 previously un, previously undeveloped land in the case of clearing clearing some forest land that would be trigger this maximization of ecosystem services and while um, uh, while there may be some negative uh, net negative impacts it's not um, uh, those ecosystem services of more open open field grasses and so forth uh, does have um, some value in terms of diversity of the ecosystem in um, uh, that can add add value to the to the uh, to the land and reduce the negative impacts. Um, so um, let's hear from Dan and then Janet and then we're going to need to um, uh, maybe bring this up as a discussion next time along with other important questions that uh, Chris has uh, sort of put forward to us uh, to deliberate on. So let's go with. Dan and then Janet and finish out. Yeah, and just like to voice my agreement with Dwayne here. And philosophically, I'm in agreement that it's a good idea to preserve forest land in Amherst. But what does it say about our values if we hold um, solar developers to higher environmental standards than any other developers in this city? Um, I think that really what we're talking about here is is beyond the scope of, of this working group if we want to be fair in our application of environmental standards. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Janet, and then we'll um, so, uh, close yeah, out so, the agenda. Yeah. So basically, yeah, you know, I think Chris will agree with me. I, Chris is, we do have zoning where there is a requirement of setting aside open space. Like, and I'm thinking about like there's open space developments and then also like in a cluster development, you get sort of, you know, if you had, you know, like, I don't know, five acres or 10 acres, I'm thinking about that place on Pine Street, I think it is. So you get to build greater density if you cluster it in one area and you might get like duplexes and blah, blah, blah. You, you get greater density if you save a parcel. And I think they did that at Puffer's Pond with those condos that are along Pine Street, like they got density and then they, um, more density, but they, they set aside a whole bunch of woods around Puffer's Pond. And so that is in our zoning thing. And reading this is, I'm just thinking, and I haven't seen it for, I didn't look at it for a while, is I think Elcher Town has this kind of requirement, like there's a limitation on the size of forest cutting and then also on the same site, there has to also be trees too. And I think that's kind of a buffering thing. So they don't have project after project, you know, stripping the land and having another project and stripping the land. And the idea is to preserve some of the, you know, the, the forest and the ecological services. So I, I don't think it's phrased this way, but I, I'm, I'm sort of grappling. I feel like we have some examples of that. All right, good. Um, I suggest we, um, close out this discussion um, and bring this uh, sec uh, uh, was a dimensional section uh, back up um, in the context of the other set of questions that are really interesting uh, and, and important for us to deliberate on um, that I think Chris did um, or Stephanie circulate that as part of this agenda, but um, I suggest we, we have that as an agenda item itself um, next next meeting uh, to discuss, continue this discussion on this section, as well as um, these uh, broader questions that Chris could really use our feedback on uh, to make her work easier to as she starts crafting some of this language. Does that sound OK with you, Chris? Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. So that'll be on the agenda for next time. Um, uh, anything else? on the agenda next time. Um, there is a possibility of um, if the if the committee or the, uh, the working group wants to potentially bring in um, Jonathan Thompson from the Harvard Forest um, was recommended by somebody. 
Um, anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we had a pretty awesome discussion about that last time going, if I recall, that we were at least, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Um, Go ahead. I, uh, that uh, I think I, I really wanted to see before we invite any speakers what the intent and what the agenda is for that speaker to cover. Um, I really, you know, I think there are so many experts out there that we could invite to present to this group. So I just want to have clarity in terms of what we're looking to achieve uh, from that conversation because we have a lot of work to do. Summer's coming and not a lot of time. Um, well, let me I'm suggest sorry. that we, in the conversation that we actually just had right now, uh, as well as uh, deliberate more on this and other questions, yeah. uh, particularly dealing with force um, uh, next week, that we um, see if we if there are some pithy, uh, specific, science-based uh, questions that we really yeah. feel and like we, we... Yeah, what we hope to gain from any presentation as it relates to our work drafting a bylaw. Um, and because, I mean... On, I know a tremendous number of experts in multiple, you know, battery storage, solar, you know, and, you know, I'm not, um, I just, I would, I would not want to waste the committee's time unless we had a clear agenda for those individuals to come and present. Um, I'm sorry, guys, I have a hard stop at 1.30. Yeah, um, okay. See you all next time. Thanks. Okay, so let's, uh, my sense is let's postpone that and, and have a discussion about that uh, next time as well. Um, um, when I actually thought he was invited possibly for this meeting. And so I, I didn't think that was a discussion item. So I, he's willing to come the next meeting. And so did, it, I mean, did I misinterpret the emails between you, me, and Stephanie? I thought that was already kind of a given. Well, I did. Uh, I mean, I think. Um... I, you know, if we don't want to hear from farmers and foresters about the importance or the effects or anything, then let's. I can just close up shop and we can just proceed speculating and making. I just. I don't get it. I'd be happy to hear from Laura's experts. I'm dying for information, but I, I can't keep on inviting this person. I asked him if he could come today, and then he can come in two weeks. And do we not want to hear about? the New England forest and the Duane, if I could, I believe when we, it came up um, at the meeting and I think Janet had offered and there was discussion about it. So I think we were following up and I think people were open to hearing from okay. him. So okay. I think we were following up on that specific oh, good. Uh, okay. request. So that's, okay. that's my recollection. We can certainly go back, but I, I think the invitation's already been extended and Janet was going to try to get him on this agenda and he wasn't available. So, okay. I, thank you. Okay. I was kind of losing okay. my Okay, if, if that was discussed before, um, then I, I stand corrected and I'm all in favor of hearing from him. I do think, uh, again, I, I'm, uh, I part of me, does, you know, it's like, let's ask, let's, let's figure out the questions we want answered uh, and, and, and then, uh, so, you know, let's all think about that, uh, for, uh, Jonathan next, uh, as we meet with him next week, what, you know, I, I think we all respect and regard and, um, like the force. Um, uh, so that's not really the question, but it's, it's, um, you know, some specific questions, uh, with regard to, uh, these ecosystem services, the, uh, um, preservation of forests around the Commonwealth, um, with the different types of forests, um, what is open space created by a solar collector due to a forest, uh, particularly if there's maximizing ecosystem services in that area, uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, so let's, um, let's go with, uh, Jonathan, if he's available, uh, next time, uh, we'll put that into the agenda. Um, but um, again, I don't think we need sort of a, a, an education on, on generalities of, of force, uh, but um, some specific issues that we're grappling with. If people want to email me questions, I'll send them to him for sure. Or Stephanie, if you want to do it through Stephanie. Why don't, if, why don't we say that people get me questions um, by the end of next week, and then I can compile them all so that he has them all at once and I'll get them to Janet. Okay. All right, um, Jack, and then we'll go to public comments. Yeah, again, I, I don't know much. I don't know this person and just wonder if we can get some sort of, you know, information on them. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. We all knew we all knew who Dave Zomack was. Um, I can send that information. His 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 publications list was so long, it was endless. Well, you know, let, let Stephanie. Yeah, yeah. I'll send that yeah. to her. Yeah. Uh, but I just I'm just kind of like sort of like not quite where Laura is, but I'm wondering what the objective is. He, you know. He's a forest ecologist. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, great. Okay, let's um, and apologize for going over, um, but let's we do have seven members of the public um, with us. So I'd like to open it up for any uh, comments, thoughts uh, from the public. Uh, and if Stephanie, if you can orchestrate that, that would be great. Okay, Mike Lipinski, I am allowing you to speak. So please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, you brought up a number of uh, different interesting topics today. And unfortunately, here we are at 1.36, and now the public gets a chance to say a few things. And the biggest supporter of solar has already left. Um, I'd like to ask you to think of a few things. One is the tone I hear a lot in this meeting today is kind of looking out for the solar companies. You know, it's how can we make sure that solar companies can can find a place to put them in? How can we protect them? How can we make sure that the fencing is not going to be too expensive? It seems to me that you guys need to have a, a little bit different approach, which is how can you protect the existing citizens that already have homes and residences and have uh, commercial properties? How can you look out for them first? not look out for some international company that's going to come in and put in a giant solar field. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, you talked about screening today. There was a lot mentioned about screening. I'd love for you guys to take a simple field trip. You don't have to do it together. All you have to do is drive down Sunderland Road towards Sunderland, go a little past the old Annie's and go to a place which is Matusco Trailer Repair. It's on the right hand side. Right next to it is a small solar array. It has screening around it. Take a good look at that screening. It's, a, it's about 50 skinny um, Arbor Vita plants that look ridiculous, that provide no visual screening at all. I'm sure someone put together a plan and said, we're going to put in screening. We're going to make sure the public can't see this. It's ridiculous. The deer have eaten them. Some of them are about the size of pencils. And yet that's considered to be screening. That's the kind of thing that can easily happen in any of these projects. You talk about a 50 foot setback from existing homes. Do you really understand what that means? I understand what it means if you're in a neighborhood and someone's going to put a shed 50 feet away from your house. But what if someone puts a 27 acre solar facility the same 50 foot distance away? You have to think in terms of scale. Yes, the shed's not too offensive, but what about 27 acres of solar panels? 50 feet away from your existing yard in an area that's already zoned residential. And now you have a commercial facility 50 feet away from it. And you put in a few blueberry bushes and you put in a few aqua vita plants and you say, there's your screening. What do you think happens to the property value of someone's home in that situation? Please take some consideration for people who already live here who already have, uh, have lived here for a long time and consider that when you consider setbacks. It's one thing to be a hundred feet away from the road, fine, 200 feet away from the road, but consider side setbacks in particular. I'm speaking from experience having a solar plant proposed to be a short distance away from the house. I know what it looks like. I know what 50 feet looks like. I know my neighbor is 200 feet away and I'm looking through the screening at his house. There's plenty of trees in the way. There's plenty of bushes. The house is still there. I can easily picture 27 acres of solar panels. They're not going to be invisible. Please consider individuals that already live here. Bylaws are, are 
intended to not look out for the interests of developers. They're also intended to look out for the interests of people who already live in places, who when they moved into a place and it was declared residential, they expected it to be residential, not be turned into a commercial industrial facility in their backyards. Thank you, Michael. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Jack, did you have any? Uh, did you have a comment on on that? And then we can uh, go with another public comment. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I know the last speaker was a little emotional, but I'm just. I, I just got caught with the size of the pencil of uh, the screening, and I'm sure that's not what he meant. But just trying to be factual, I guess, in terms of um, what's going on there. But I will try to make an attempt to, to go up there and see. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, Stephanie, do you want to let Renee speak? Uh Stephanie, I can't hear you. Can, I don't know if you all can hear me. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Renee. I did just say that I, I muted myself again. Um, I was just saying that we can hear you. And oh, okay. Thanks. Um, well, I but I raised my hand before Mike. Well, before I knew what Mike was going to say, I was raising my hand. But first of all, I just want to support strongly what what Mike Lipinski just said, and I do want to also. The, one of the main things I wanted to say was that it, these meetings are really frustrating in that almost every single meeting, public comment is after the meeting is over. The person taking notes, who, as Mike said, is a real proponent of the, the companies that build the solar arrays and who gets to be referred to all the time, she was taking minutes and now she's not even here for public comment. So I, I think, and I have spoken to one of the town councilors about this issue that for this meeting, the comments are almost always after the meeting is officially over. And I think that's very unfair. And I almost, I, I don't know Rod, I don't know the rules of the town, but I, I, I think it violates the, these the town meeting, these 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 meetings, these committee meetings. So I just want to um, just want to express my concern about that. You know, I I've, I've come to all of your you know all of your um, outreach to the public and everything, and I think that this is really a sham. This this public comments at the end, and I I feel very hurt by it and very um, very angry about it. So, um, and especially that, that even Jack spoke during public comment time that he was called on before me. Anyway, I, they, but obviously that won't be in the minutes. So um, thank, Renee, you. I'm, thank I'm, you for your work. Renee, I just wanted to note that I'm taking minutes. Um, I picked that up after Laura left. Thank you. Right, great, thank you, Renee. And, um, all right, and maybe, um, um, Stephanie, I can, I can reach out to Stephanie and, and Chris to to um, talk about the public comments and make sure at least that we're on um, solid ground legally, but I think I believe we are. Uh, but uh, appreciate the um, the concern, Renee. Okay, and, Kathleen um, Bridgewater. Yeah. You can go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Um, I guess what I'd like to speak to is the issue of the forest and the forest ecology. And I cannot get over how time and again, Janet in particular brings up the issue of how we absolutely must understand what is going on in that forest before anyone thinks of raising it. And I don't understand why there seems to be such pushback every time she opens her mouth to recommend that we have an expert attend these meetings who can give information about forest ecology and the the uh, recommendation that a forest ecology should be ruined, permanently ruined, and put in its place a 20 to 30 year possible solar, uh, what, solar, 
on the, they say farm, but it's really a solar factory that will become obsolete and which will need to be replaced. And I just don't understand why we are putting the cart before the horse. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, appreciate all those comments. Um, I don't see any other um, comments uh, from the public. Uh, we have one more, Jenny Kallick. Mm -hmm. Jenny, go ahead, you can unmute yourself. <clears throat> Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just to follow up about the idea of setting aside land uh, to equal the forest that's being cut, two points on that. The developer can limit the size of the array. So if 50 acres are available, if there's a setback requirement, uh, the array can simply be uh, made smaller. So it, is, it doesn't have to do with going out and buying land somehow. Regarding uh, the point that Dan made about, we don't require anything about forests for other builders. If you go back and look at the master plan, the recommendations there to protect forests were strong, were developed with what the master plan says was a thousand uh, residents participating, carefully developed. The fact that the town never acted on the master plan recommendations is doesn't undercut the fact that the town values and what the town agreed to do in relationship to forest is absolutely firm and clear. So the idea that we never thought about forest land before is incorrect. It's very clearly delineated in the master plan. So I hope people are, re are referencing the master plan. It's really a fantastic document to show what the town believes about itself and wants uh, for land use. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, um, any other uh, public Can comments? I like what you mentioned, Jenny. Great. Okay, uh, appreciate people's um, going true. over time here um, and right. apologize to the public for taking comments late. Um, Martha, did you have one last comment to make? So, uh, I mean, in light, in light of this, uh, I would like to recommend, and maybe we can discuss this next time, setting aside a specific time that we would start public comments, even if it means cutting off something else we're in the middle of doing, uh, sometime during the middle or the last 15 minutes or whatever, that we actually conscientiously agree to some specific time that we would just move to public comments and then uh, have our closing up uh, afterwards. That would be something I'd like us to discuss. Not right now, but, you know, yep. next time. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, with that, uh, and appreciate that, and I appreciate everybody's um, time and effort on this. Um, let's uh, adjourn the meeting and we will reconvene in two weeks. Uh, it's still looking good and, and um, <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, and my note that it might have to be in person is no longer valid. So we'll, uh, we'll remain remote as we've been doing. Okay, thank you everybody and have a good, have a good weekend. <laughs>